Chapter 14 A Rational Society Manifestly, once the dual power is resolved and the confederated municipalities have overcome the forces arrayed against them, sovereign power in society will be in their hands. Citizens may then bring the potentiality of this sovereign political realm to fulfilment by transforming society along rational and ethical lines. To the extent that human beings can collectively sculpt the society in which they live, their means for doing so lie neither in the social realm, nor in a state, but in the political realm. The social realm, as we have seen, is involved with matters of the family, with the private matters of the individual, and with the economic aspects of life, with production and distribution. Family and individual matters are too narrow in scope to have a great influence on the rest of society, and while matters of production and distribution have greater influence, it is still partial. Factories and workplaces are simply not places where decisions about all of society can be made, and economic life easily breaks apart into separate sectoral or entrepreneurial interests. The state, for its part, is not a place where people collectively shape society. It is a place where an elite few wield power over a majority. Thus, the means for collectively reshaping society lie in the political realm itself, in the place where decisions about how society is to function are explicitly and consciously made by the community. If decision-making is actually to be collective, it must be directly democratic. That is, its political institutions must be those of libertarian municipalism, based on the presupposition that every normal adult is competent to engage in community self-management. Once people have collectively taken the reins of their decision-making power, then they may plan and decide what kind of society they want to be a part of and leave for future generations to enjoy and improve. The kind of society that they choose to create will be theirs alone to decide democratically. It cannot be ordained by theorists of libertarian municipalism, but to a great extent, the continued existence of a direct democratic political realm will depend on whether the citizens rebuild the social realm according to the same ethical values and practices that undergird their political realm. It will likely not survive if the choices they make about the rest of society contradict those values and practices. Among these values would be mutuality, a sense of mutual identification among citizens, and complementarity, a sense of responsibility for one's fellow citizens and their families, and of obligation for everyone's welfare. If solidarity and reason infuse civic life, they would have to be grounded in a mutuality, a humanism and cooperation, that pervaded the rest of society as well. An ethos of cooperation and solidarity would have many social consequences, not least of which would be an abolition of hierarchy and domination, not only of the state but of institutionalised social stratifications based on gender, race, ethnicity, age and other status distinctions, stratifications that obstruct mutuality by virtue of the inequality and domination they entail. A moral economy. This ethos would also have to infuse economic life if the political realm is to survive. A society organised along mutualistic, non-hierarchical and communal lines would be most rational if it chose to replace the capitalist market economy with a moral economy, one whose members are possessed of a high sense of mutual obligation. It would replace classes and private property with cooperation and solidarity. It would replace profit with a recognition of mutual welfare. It would replace selling with sharing. It would replace rivalry and an illusory independence with, reci with reciprocity and interdependence by replacing a profit-oriented economic nexus with an ethical one. It would transform economics into culture. What would economic production look like in such a society? Onerous forms of production that required arduous toil or that were mind-numbingly tedious would be performed not by people but by machines in factories. The products, 
and technologies essential for a post-scarcity society would be manufactured in industrial plants. Durable goods and medical equipment, textiles, means of communication and transportation, machine tools, electronics and so on. The productive technologies in these factories would be enhanced far more than they are now by processes of automation and cybernation that would allow the machines themselves to perform work with a minimum of human labour. Machines would make machines, as they already do to a great extent, and would require human intervention mainly for design and repair. Specialists would design reasonably and obtrusive factories whose machines, in the event of a breakdown, would be repaired by maintenance people. But very little, if any, manufacturing production would require toil or tedium, let alone significant labour. It may seem jarring to speak of such industrialism in the same breath as values of complementarity and mutuality, but industrialism is at odds with cooperation only if one considers industrialism to be synonymous with capitalism and the exploitation of labour. The industrial plant in a libertarian municipalist society would be collectively owned by the people and cooperatively managed as part of a moral economy, not a capitalist economy. Perhaps more important, the minimization of human labour would create the material preconditions for a society infused by mutuality and cooperation. Indeed, it is the very productivity of such factories that would make possible the prevalence of the mutualistic ethos of the rational society. This point is crucial. Past revolutions have founded on the fact that their eras lacked a sufficiency in the means of production to free people from toil and provide them not only with a reasonable level of comfort but with the free time they need to engage in community self-management. Over hundreds of years of revolutionary activity, the mass of people who try to transform social life along rational lines have been driven back, in part, because their technological level could not support the new social relations that could emancipate them from hunger, long hours of work and class rule. Today, however, that technological capacity exists. A rational, anarchist society would take the next step and use that technological apparatus to ensure that people have freedom rather than to subject them to domination and exploitation. Some labour, of course, will always be necessary for the maintenance of the society. By the mutualistic ethos that prevailed, such socially necessary labour would be divided equally among those capable of performing it. But because most of the work would be performed by machines, such labour would not require much time to perform. Factory production, of course, need not preclude the handcrafting of objects that enhance life for those who derive satisfaction from such activities. Indeed, factory production of the basic components of a crafted product would leave craftspeople free to concentrate on its more artistic and expressive dimensions. Those who enjoy weaving fabrics, for example, could let machines perform the tedious work of turning fibres into threads, but they could weave on hand looms for their own enjoyment to produce textiles for friends and community alike. So too, people who enjoy the sensuous experience of gardening could grow their own food if they choose, and the aesthetic pleasures of small-scale farming activities are considerable. But many people might not choose to spend time growing their own food, preferring other activities that would obtain their food from agricultural processes that are partly or perhaps fully industrialised. The bulk of agricultural production, in fact, would be mechanised, allowing the onerous drudgery of hard farm labour finally to recede into the distant past. Not only would industrialised agriculture be desirable, it would be necessary if society were to support growing human populations. It is frankly a naive fantasy shared by some radical environmentalists today to think that society could return to digging sticks, foraging and horse-drawn ploughs except on an individual basis to satisfy strictly personal desires. Nor is industrial agriculture incompatible with organic methods. Food cultivated industrially could well be organic, and the machines used for it would be designed to have minimal negative effects on the soil and its ecology. The same principle of choice 
and it should be recalled that without choice there is no freedom, could be applied to the production of all manner of material objects. In effect, a person's vocation could be a moral calling for a personal preference, not an occupation that they were coerced or otherwise compelled to perform. Without physically exhausting and tedious labour consuming most of their time, people would be free to live more creative, expressive lives, and their choice of activities would reflect their wishes rather than the stringent demands of the realm of necessity. If production based on reducing human labour is a precondition for a moral economy, equitable distribution would bring that economy to fulfilment. Distribution would be consistent with the humanistic and cooperative values of a libertarian, municipalist polity if it were participatory, affording the irreducible minimum of the means of life to everyone in the community. It would offer all community members the material means that they need to fulfil their human potentialities and to conduct an aesthetically pleasing and ethical life. Needless to say, economic inequality would be non-existent. The only inequalities would be those resulting from strength, age, health and individual aptitudes. But these inequalities, rather than being pretexts for domination, would be compensated for socially, so that those who need more support would have ready access to it. Operating according to the principle, from each according to ability to each according to need, distribution would cease to be a matter of economics at all. Without the capitalist economy, whose grow-or-die imperative is the primary force behind the ecological crisis, citizens would be free to reconstruct their social world along ecological lines. Cities could be physically as well as institutionally decentralised, town and country could be integrated into a unified whole and the historic conflict between them effaced. Fossil fuels would doubtless be eliminated, replaced with clean, renewable sources of energy, even in factory production. The world of non-human nature would no longer be conceived as a realm of scarcity, as capitalism conceives it today, with too few resources that must be fought for tooth and claw, but as a domain of fecundity and evolutionary advance toward diversity and complexity. That the citizens in a new polity will be willing to recreate their society according to these principles is not something that we can predict with certainty. The essence of democracy, after all, is that they will have a choice. But insofar as they wish to preserve their direct democracy, their choices will have to be guided by reason. If they were to choose to restore the command factory labour system, for example, when it is no longer necessary, it would be irrational. It would be irrational for them to choose to restore capitalism and once again unleash the profit motive to wreak havoc on society and on the biosphere. It would be irrational for them to transform municipal confederations into states. It would be irrational to exclude an ethnic or gender group from political participation. A liberatory and ecological anarchist society would be impossible without an ethos of mutuality and complementarity. But that ethos in turn is unthinkable without the exercise of reason to support its values and practices against all the unsavoury alternatives.